our eighth module of the BEAM initiative, uh, how to develop a strategic plan. And I just want to highlight um, as we get going that this is a two-part module. So um, today we'll be talking more about some of the conceptual approaches to kind of, to kind of developing a strategic plan. Um, and next week we're going to uh, focus, not next week, two weeks from now in our next webinar, we'll focus uh, very, very clearly on, on the more um, kind of implementation challenges of, of implementing a strategic plan and, you know, some of the logistics of what do you do and that kind of stuff. Um, so just, we're going to talk a little bit about our, the data submission that was, was due uh, uh, earlier in the week and, and we've extended the deadline for folks who still need a little extra time to fill it out. Um, go back a little bit over last week real quickly. Um, we were talking about strategic planning. Um, uh, Peter Campanelli is with us today, and he's going to talk about defining strategic planning, what's, why do strategic planning, um, and then some of the key concepts. Uh, and then Joy, Dave Warzniak, who's, who's often with us, is going to talk a bit about um, what strategic plan look like and then some considerations. Uh, we may not get to the considerations piece as well um, today, but they're, they're a part of the slides, and we will uh, we'll make um, – make sure that, that, that those slides are up online and, and available for folks to take a look at. So um, then we'll talk about action steps and then, and then we'll wrap up and, and get you guys all back to what, at least in New York City today, I don't know about the rest of the state, but at least in New York City today is a really nice day outside. Um, so finance financial uh, benchmarking tool is, was due earlier this week, um, but we've extended the deadline until next Wednesday. Um, we really want to get as many of them back as possible. Um, please, uh, if you haven't turned it in already, submit it to beam at ccsi.org. Uh, that's the email. Uh, and then, you know, if, if you, for some reason at this point, haven't, haven't uh, if you for some reason at this point haven't um, submitted or haven't downloaded the benchmarking tool, um, it is online at our, on our website, and you can submit any questions uh, that you have to the Qualtrics survey that's listed there. Um, so last time we talked about uh, we talked about kind of buckets and, and identifying what was important and those kinds of things. Um, so hopefully you had time to sit down with your your, qual your um, core implementation team and discuss kind of what variables are in your financial model, um, which ones can you really affect, which ones can't you affect, and then kind of where do they fall into that impact framework. So hopefully um, you were able to do that over the last couple of weeks. Um, and then uh, Evelyn, can we throw up the polling questions really quickly? Oh, great. Um, so we have three polling questions. Some are the, usually the same. Um, did you log in uh, as yourself or as a core team? Um, who's on the line um, in terms of clinic, you know, finance staff, clinic leadership, executive leadership, clinicians, or professional staff? Um, and then at what level have you been involved in a strategic planning process before? So we just want to kind of get a sense of um, kind of where you're at as, as, as part of strategic planning processes in the past. Um, you know, either at a program level, at an agency level, um, involved at a governance level, involving your board, or you've never been involved in the strategic planning process. So, Ev, if you give people another 10 seconds or so to fill those out and then um, close it down and we'll see what the results are. Okay, Evelyn, if we can shut it down and see what the results are. And as always, this takes this process takes a little longer than one would reasonably think it should. But we should have it shortly. All right. Oh, okay. There we go. So the vast majority of folks are logged in by themselves, um, and then uh, it looks to be pretty evenly split uh, in terms of people who participated in the strategic planning process between you know a program level or at an agency level. Uh, fewer folks have participated with their board in this process, and then some folks hadn't participated at all. So, so thank you for your feedback. Um, with that, I'm going to pass this on to. Uh, Peter Campanelli, who's going to talk, uh, start talking us through um, strategic planning. And Justine, I'm passing you the slides to move them now. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Peter Campanelli, and I'm going to walk you through some of the, the stages and and uh, and concepts involved in, in strategic planning this this morning. Um, and um, as we go through them, if you have any questions, feel free to just chat in the chat box down below, and we'll try to answer your questions as we go along. Justine. 
Ah, okay. Defining strategic planning. Uh, it's a systematic process. It's very simple, and it gets focused on uh, either a key question or a group of questions involving either a program or an organization. Organization, um, and as as was said earlier. Uh, strategic planning can occur at a program agency or governance level, depending on whether you're focusing on a program or an entire agency. There are different types of planning. Strategic planning itself emphasizes an immediate volatile environment that's difficult to predict. Um, and it's created for the purpose of immediate leadership for the organization and establishing a fundamental directional and overarching uh, direction for the organization and or the program. Um, it's different from long-range planning, which is an emphasis on uh, the long-term future when circumstances in the future are reliably predictable, not often the case in mental health services. Uh, business planning, uh, very different from business planning in the sense that you're assessing the viability of a particular business in terms of opportunities and threats. Um, and, and we'll see in a minute how those can be combined. And operational planning primarily affects the day-to-day -day implementation of strategic decisions and gets to be important when we arrive at a plan and we decide we're going to implement it. Effective strategic planning generally blends different types of planning processes. So incorporating long-range planning in terms of strategic planning might look like what do you think will stay constant and what will change. And as you develop your plan, you basically try to uh, extrapolate what, what you think will stay constant and what will change. Incorporating business planning, um, the various program components that you're operating, most not-for-profits aren't able to provide the kind of detail anticipated for business plans because of unpredictability of revenue. And in volatile times, revenue gets even more unpredictable. But business planning is becoming increasingly important. Um, and to be able to form a strategic plan, you do, do need to understand the sustainability of the program that you're talking about and whether or not in the foreseeable future that revenue stream that funds that program is going to change dramatically. Uh, and if so, that needs to be built into your st strategic plan. And then finally, Incorporating operational planning, an effective strategic plan, builds upon organizational capacity. You have to have the capacity to implement the decisions you make with respect to your strategic plan, and you have to have the ability to track those on a regular basis. Strategic planning is all about building bridges from where you are to where you believe you need to be at the end of the strategic planning process. So why engage in strategic planning? One needs to meth uh, methodically go through the options. You need a, a process that involves choosing how best to respond to circumstances uh, in a dynamic and sometimes hostile environment. Not-for-profit organizations have many choices out there, and they're, cha they're facing a very volatile and unpredictable future. And so they need to infuse as much predictability and as much planning into the future as they possibly can and commit to one direction that everyone can sign on to within the organization. There are some guiding principles that you need to follow when you do strategic planning. You need to focus on the most important issues during the strategic planning process. What is critical for the success of your agency and or program? You need to be willing to question both the status quo and the sacred cows and examine every single op option that's out there. You need to produce a document so that there's a written record of the strategic planning process that everyone can agree to. And finally, you need to make sure that the strategic plan is translated into an annual operating plan and that it contains metrics that can be evaluated. This is particularly important, especially when you think about the benchmarking tools that many of you use, are using uh, to evaluate clinic and clinic functioning. The data on those benchmarking tools can be essential in a strategic planning process. Key elements of the strategic planning process. Follow a process that is both structured and data-driven. Make sure that you're working from data that has been arrived at uh, from reliable sources, and be sure that 
that the process raises a sequence of questions that help, helps planners examine past experiences. Take a look at the historical base in terms of the program or the clinic that you're, you're looking at. Take a look at what it's done in the past. Uh, take a look at what it's likely to do in the future. Make sure that you're using uh, data to examine those, those, those issues. Test old assumptions. Um, will this pattern of, of activity change? And incorporate new information about the present and anticipate the environment in which the organization will be working in the future. Um, and build that into your strategic plan as well. Are there things you need to get ready for in the future that you're not yet ready for? Why data-driven? Data brings to the surface a variety of options to consider regarding the organization uh, and what the organization will or will not do. It's, it's important to incorporate uh, implications of those choices at the financial, organizational, and cultural level. Too often, mental health services make decisions based entirely on their mission, and their mission hasn't been reevaluated uh, in the face of new business uh, environments that are constantly evolving out there. Results in making choices, some of which have significant trade-offs, need to be examined. And finally, hard choices uh, are often not overly complex, but need to be considered from all angles. Peter, can you talk a little bit about that and how you, like, as an organization, go about making some of those hard choices and, and, and what data you should be looking at? Like, when you, you know, how do you decide as an agency what data is the most important for you to look at? Well, I can tell you that, that there are two issues that drive um, changes in, in organizations. And, and uh, that has to do with the clinical performance. Are, are clients getting the kinds of services that they need, and how do you know that? What kind of clinical outcome can you look at? And secondly, what kind of, of financial outcome can you look at? Is, are these programs meeting the financial demands of the overall organization and its operations? Um, and who is looking at that data gets to be as important as what they're looking at. Uh, you need to make sure, if you're at a program level, that you're getting significant decision makers in the organization in the room to examine both financial and clinical data so that you can make sound decisions about programs, continuation of programs, um, which would be one of the hard choices that need to be made in the future. All right. Thanks, Peter. Finally, strategic planning is, is a means to an end. Um, it provides an explicit understanding of new positions, mission, and organizational values among staff. It provides a blueprint for action based on current information, milestones against which to monitor achievement, and information that can be used to market organization uh, to the public in the future. In the future, um, market-driven strategies are going to be much more important in, in mental health services, uh, and uh, organizations will be competing uh, with other organizations for marketplace position. Strategic planning is purposely disruptive. If you get a bunch of people in a room and you're all there simply to maintain the status quo, then you're really not uh, engaging in strategic planning. And you examine everything in that process, including the mission of the program and of the organization and whether or not it makes sense in the current environment. Could you say, Peter, that if you're in a room doing strategic planning and everybody agrees and it's an easy and pleasant process the <laughs> entire time that you probably haven't done everything? done what you need to do? Yeah, I think you're probably doing something very wrong if that's the case. Um, okay. You need to get people in the room who will be willing to make uh, hard choices, who are willing to question whether or not they're going in the right direction, who are willing to, to uh, argue uh, for a different direction. And if, in fact, you get everybody in the room agreeing, then you've probably got the wrong people in the room. Okay. Uh, engaging stakeholders. Uh, another group of people that you really need to talk to when you're engaging in, in strategic planning are stakeholders out there. Stakeholders include leadership within the organization, but they also include clients, funders, regulators, um, people in the surrounding community who will be affected by any change you make in the program that interacts with that community. It has to be an inclusive process, and there are different ways you can include those people. You can include them by telephone survey. You can include them by letter survey. 
you can include them by inviting them into the room for different aspects of the strategic planning process. The more outside thinking you get into the room as you go through this process, the better off you are. And whatever you do, don't believe that no matter what happens, someone will come along and save the organization or the program because it's just so good it's worth saving, um, particularly in the current environment. Uh, th there are no bailouts that are out there, and, and, um, and so if you don't plan on being successful, you probably won't be successful, and a strategic plan is the best way to get you there. Engaging executive leadership. This one's a hard one because if you're operating at a program level, uh, you could certainly engage in all of the planning you want to engage in, but unless you get executive leadership buy-in, it's not going to be effective and it may not even happen. Yet executives have really good reason to be in the room during a strategic planning process, even if it only involves one or two of, of multiple programs that exist in the agency. Um, so an organization should embark on this continued planning effort, uh, which costs money and time because they're spending money and time operating programs, and they need to make sure they're operating the right programs for the right people and that there is financial viability underlying those programs. Um, you can engage senior management by simply pointing out to them that the chances are that they'll lose an awful lot of money unless they're engaging in the right activities. Making the case, the key message, strategic planning helps organizations do a better job. It's really that simple. It creates a business case for why leadership uh, should go in a particular direction. It certainly provides backup to leadership when they do make those kinds of decisions. Um, and it helps everyone question how will this positively affect the agency's bottom line. And in this day and age, that has to be a real consideration. Um, and finally, program-level folks can take the initiative and bring solutions to the table. Uh, and if you bring financial projections in, if you bring models in that help predict the future, if you bring models in that help explain why this program is clinically important and significant, it will really help make the decision-making uh, a lot easier. Okay. And any other suggestions? I'll just Because I know that you very recently held one of those executive positions. And just in, in having staff who sometimes don't have always have access to senior leadership, being able to get them involved in the process. Because one of the things we hear a lot from, from clinics is, you know, at the clinic level, they kind of know that this is a real problem, but it, they haven't always necessarily been able to engage the kind of executives in, the, in their agencies, which may be larger than the clinic. Well, I think there are a lot of issues here. I, I, you know, certainly executives um, and, and CFOs, CFOs are probably the best ways to get to, to the upper level management of the organization um, because okay. they're the people who are watching the bottom line constantly. And, okay. and if you're operating a program and monitoring your benchmarking tool and you happen to know that you're losing twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a month, then you need to bring that to the attention of the CFO pretty quickly. Um, and you, odds are you'll get his attention or her attention and you'll get them in the room. Okay, great. And once once you manage to get the senior executives in the room, is this something that ends up going on board agendas and those kinds of things to monitor progress as it develops over time? Oh, there's no question it should. Um, there's no question that most organizations have finance committees, and those finance committees review uh, on a monthly basis the organization's bottom line. And if they're doing it correctly, they're reviewing the organization's bottom line on a program-by-program program specific basis or certainly class of program by class of program. And so if they're, ta if they're tracking that appropriately and they're beginning to see uh, red ink run through those spreadsheets, then the, the board at the finance committee level should be reacting to that. Okay, great. So one of the things that as a, as a program working with your executive management you want, may want to do is to think about reports that can go to your, to your board's finance committee meeting to show where you are with your clinic and then how you're progressing over time. Yeah, but it's always important to make sure that as you bring those reports, you also bring uh, suggestions for approaches and solutions, even if that Absolutely. suggestion is nothing more than, than developing a strategic planning process. Okay, great. Thank you, Peter. How do you know it's working? Uh, the creation of a discussion on why the organization exists 
and shared values, values that should influence decisions. Once that kind of discussion begins to occur within strategic planning, then you know it's beginning to work. Uh, you also know it's beginning to work when you're getting successful communication and teamwork between the board of directors and staff. And as I said, the, the committee structure for boards of directors is very important in terms of reaching up to the full board and being able to get a dialogue operating within that full board. Um, a key focus on what's really important lays the groundwork for meaningful change. People have to understand what is really important, what is mission-driven for us, and what perhaps is not mission-driven and is not all that important. Uh, and finally, everyone's attention is reoriented back to the critical issues that define success for the organization. That's one of the reasons you engage in strategic planning. You need to try to make sure your organization is as successful as possible in the future. What strategic planning is not? Um, there are many things that, that, that strategic planning is not, and, and knowing what those are is very important. Strategic planning does not predict the future. It doesn't tell you with any certainty whatsoever what's going to happen in the future. It is not a substitute for judgment and leadership, um, and it's certainly not a smooth and predictable linear path. What it is is a group of people entering into a dialogue to arrive at the best possible scenario with respect to the future and then plan predicated on that scenario. But there are never any guarantees that the future will unfold as you believe it will. So a summary of key concepts here. Um, strategic planning is intentional. It's an intentional response to current environment. Keep in mind you have threats and opportunities out there, and understanding the market competition is essential. For every threat, there is an opportunity. You need to find it. Systematic and data-driven. You can't make um, uh, strategic decisions predicated upon uh, one's uh, um, uh, uh, desire to see something happen. You have to have data to make sure that, that uh, your desire to see something happen is actually supported by the numbers. Uh, it sets priorities and makes decisions about direction and goals. Um, it basically is a written plan that everyone can sign on to. It builds commitment among staff, board, and stakeholders. Everyone should be pulling in the same direction. And it guides resource acquisition and allocation. You're going to spend money in the future no matter what you do, but you want your, your, the organization of the spending and, and allocation of those resources to be in a direction that's consistent with what everyone believes should be happening on a strategic planning process. And strategic planning involves innovation, developing a strategy, and success. And this cartoon is a particular favorite of mine, and this is the point at which we're going to hand over the phone to, oh. to David. Um, but uh, if, you, if your president or CEO is engaging in strategic planning in this fashion, you've got a problem. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, uh, this is Dave Warsnick. Um, if you've been following these webinars, um, I've been working primarily in the financial, with the financial modeling. And uh, I wanted to be involved with today's um, today's webinar because Peter's really begun talking about the framework in which we've been working. And you know, I would take that key concept slide and make a copy of that and, and put that on the wall because it's really such a critical aspect of doing the process within a structure. And it may not have seemed like that as we've been talking because we've been really focusing primarily on this modeling piece. We've been focusing on data and, and but what we really started is giving you tools and giving you ideas and concepts that are really critical to support your, your, your strategic plan to move forward. Uh, the other piece that I think is really critical is what Peter was talking about is how to engage executive leadership. 
I know that Andy has talked about many of the t many of you that have talked to us have been finding it difficult to engage executive leadership in the process. And as Peter said, as executive leadership reacts to the bottom line, and possibly it's the CFO who's your first entree. But if, as you begin thinking about it, and, and as Peter is talking about, strategic plan and strategic processes are effective when your stakeholders are all on board, you're working towards the same goal, your mission and vision are aligned, and you're moving forward. And I think that it's very important that you find ways within your organization to assure that your executive leadership and possibly even your board, as Peter has talked about, is on board with the process. Because in many cases, the decisions that Peter talked about in the, in the final concepts is, requires an allocation of resources. And you at the program level may not have the authority with your, within your organization to make some of the difficult decisions as it may relate to fringe benefits or the number of hours per week or um, the rates that you're going to be paying your fee-for-service staff, those kind of things. So th kind of things may be out of your authority, a level of authority, but they may be key operational uh, decisions that need to be made. And without the individuals at the table, uh, understanding where we are, what the history is, where we need to be, and what defines success, it's going to be very difficult for this strategic plan planning process uh, to be effective. So what I'm going to do is spend a little bit of time here and talk a little bit about the strategic planning phases and try to tie those back a little bit uh, to what we've been trying to do uh, over the last um, 16 weeks or so uh, to bring you to the point where you can create plans and implement them. So, you know, defining the content of each phase, um, identify the reason for planning. As Peter had talked, planning could be at an organizational level, at a governance level, at a program level. What you've been involved with is planning at the program level. Many of you came to the planning process because of, because of um, uh, fiscal challenges. Um, other may have come to the planning process because they needed help in increasing access for their compliant or for their clients or thinking more about environmental changes that you're going to be facing in the future. So you need to know why you're there for the planning process. And then setting up the planning process and define success. Especially establish roles and responsibilities for the participants. That's why we've been talking with you about is about your team. Who's who needs to be at the table? Um, how you engage um, buy-in from finance, from programs, from staff, you really need to set up the process so you're starting from a point where you have a better, better chance for success. Then develop a data gathering methodology, what information is required. But not only have we been talking about information that is required for the benchmarking tool, uh, people have looked, been looking at all kinds of information, cancellation, no-show rates, the time it takes from a, a telephone call to a first appointment, the time it takes from a telephone call to a psychiatric evaluation, uh, caseload sizes. Um, all these different pieces of information are important parts of the, of the process, particularly as you, as you look at what are the opportunities, you need to be taking a look at the data. So the developing that data gathering methodology, and many of you had to go in and find ways to get the inform information that you need. And identify what process meets your organization's needs. And this is really going to happen, it's going to change by organization to organization, what's your culture, what is the best way to proceed with the process, what level of your organization is involved. And how do you track your process of your plan? So as you begin the planning process, the planning as we talked about here is in phases. There, 
they're distinct, they are linear in some fashion, and you need to track where you started, what the next step is, where you're going next. That's sort of been the way that we've been doing the webinar, some incremental learning, gathering the information, gathering knowledge, looking at your opportunities, and then use tools such as work plans. There's all kinds of tools out there to help you manage uh, a process such as this. There's, uh, simple things like what are the tasks, who's responsible, uh, what date do we anticipate um, they're going to be completed by, and then on a periodic basis uh, evaluating how you are in moving towards uh, meeting your goals and following your work plans. Phase two, mission, vision, and values. Um, this is something that Peter, Peter talked about, and it's probably not something that people have thought much about. And Peter had, had mentioned at one point, is your mission still sustainable uh, given the current economic environment? So you have a mission in the organization, and you may even have mission and vision statements for your program level. What we want to caution people against is, is as you move through and do your strategic plan and you get to your plans and you're setting your outcomes and you're setting your goals, if you're setting goals and outcomes that are inconsistent with the organizational mission and vision um, and you're not including executive leadership in that, there's going to be a significant disconnect as you begin trying to implement portions of your plan. So at the program level, I think the first question you need to answer is, is where we're moving this clinic, is it consistent with the mission and vision and values of the organization? If the answer is yes, then I think you're on a, you're on a good track moving forward. But if the answer is no, then you really have to engage your executive leadership. So if you have a mission in your organization that you are going to provide outpatient mental health services to anybody who walks in the door, independent of their ability to pay, and part of what you're talking about as a program team is limiting access for third-party insurance clients, as an example, where you now have a disconnect from the program level you don't see the mission as being sustainable, but without that conversation with the executive leadership and with your board, that disconnect is going to lead to some very difficult conversations moving forward and may inhibit your ability to, to make the kinds of decisions and, and move the needle in the way that you need to move it. Um, and just as an aside, I think many organizations now are re-looking at their mission statement. Uh, the environment, as Peter had said, mission statements were written in a different, in, for many organizations in a different era, in a different environment. The environment, um, I tell people this all the time, I've been doing this for um, over 30 years and I have never, ever seen the environment moving as quickly and dramatically as it is right now. So we need to stop and take a second and say, okay, are, are we sustainable and, and under this mission? And if not, uh, let's talk about it. But that's really a discussion that needs to occur with executive leadership and at the board level. So identifying data-informed decisions. Peter talked a lot about the strategic planning processes being data-driven. Uh, we've talked um, in terms of what we've been presenting to you uh, through, through the last couple months is really how do you identify the data. The benchmarking tool is really decide, designed to allow you to key in on those variables that really make an effect as it relates to the bottom line of your, of your clinic and understanding their sensitivity. Another thing that Peter talked about, summarize the organization's history. Where have you come from? What have you accomplished? Build those into the narrative. Um, people are very proud of the clinical outcomes that they have. They have to be part of, of the data that's in. We talk a lot about um, 
uh, scorecard, blended scorecards. Let's let's not just hone in on the the financial piece. Let's involve a, a, a sense of what we do well and how we can build upon that as part of our strategy. Uh, gather information from both internal and external stakeholders. What does the community need? What does the what does executive leadership want? What does the board want? Uh, what do your clinicians need? Look at a broader base of, of data and information. Are your clients satisfied? Um, you know, these all have to be part of the, of the process for planning and change. And then collect objective data to evaluate current programs. That's really what we've been focusing on is you need the data. You need to know what your cost per unit is. You need to know what your revenue per unit is. You need to know what your payer mix is. You need to know what the future holds for you. And summarize your information and collect it so you can draw conclusions for change management process. It's really what we talked about last week when I, I showed you the different scenarios that you can build in, in the model. You need to put that information in a workable format. You need to draw conclusions as we were talking about and, and is you know, what can you change? What can't you change? Um, you know, is there low-hanging fruit that we can go after right away and build some momentum and some success? Uh, but you need data to be able to do that. And the other thing that we hope that you'll be able to do is take the tools that, that we've been providing with you, quantify your data, understand why you are where you are, what opportunities you have, and take that, that, that story, that scenario, that that narrative and, and, and take it to your take it to your executive leadership if they're not involved in the process. I think that what we hope that we will be able to do is provide you with a very compelling story uh, to engage them as part of the planning. Arriving at decision, analyze your data. That's what we did. I analyze your data. Take a look at where you are, where you're going, what your opportunities are. Um, and in light of the data, and in light of your mission, and in light of what you can and cannot change, what are our priorities? Where do we need to start? What is the sensitivity here in the tool? What, you know, what do we really need to do? If, if you're stable fiscally and, and you really need to, in preparation for uh, what Peter had called uh, 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 market-driven strategies, how we can we reduce wait time, how we can do open access for people, how can we build efficiencies into our operation. We need to ask those questions, what do we need to do? And then, uh, you know, assess your, your program performance and agree on strategies. It's really been what we talk about, uh, summarize your future program perspectives and agree on administrative, financial, and governance priorities. Again, we're talking again, engage your executive leadership, engage your financial leadership, and your governance priorities and your board priorities, and it ties back to your mission and your vision. Um, so again, um, you know, have the data, and as Peter said, have the solutions. As you begin to engage your executive leadership, it's okay to know where you are. Um, but you really need to lay out where we can go, where we need to be. And as I showed yesterday, and although we talked about what can you change and what can't you change, um, you need to understand the effect that each of those variables are having. So if you have a very high percentage of fringe benefit as, and it's a strain on your cost structure, you need to know that. You need to talk with your executive leadership about that. It may not be something that you can change, but it may be something that organizationally uh, your executive leadership might be willing to look at. And produce a plan. Create your goals and objectives. Our goal is to increase productivity by 5%. And it's going to, we're going to have that done by uh, September 30th. And so then is what is the long range financial projections against that? All right, we know that if we can start that today, we can have that done by September, then this will be what our bottom line will look at it like at the end of the year. But all things being equal, we'll project this out, we'll annualize it. 
over through next year and that by the following next year that we'll be in the, in the position we need to. So your short-term changes as you put them together are going to have, an, have incremental effects based upon the sensitivity to the change when you put them in place. But it's important to have that long-range projection and that's going to be important when you talk to your executive leadership also. Here are the changes we're looking. This is where it's going to get us today. This is where it's going to get us uh, 12 months from now. This is where it's going to get us 18 months from now. I take that plan out. Take that plan out two years. Uh, be thinking about your future environment and your future um, opportunities um, and have that plan clearly articulated. What you're going to do, when you're going to do it, who's going to be responsible, uh, when you're going to know if you're successful how you're going to know you're successful and what you're going to do if you're finding that your strategies are not as successful um, as you thought they were going to be. So if you put your plan together, it's clearly articulated, it's clearly documented, it has timelines attached to it, you know who's going to do what, um, you've engaged your executive leadership, uh, it fits within your mission in, in values of the organization, then you go ahead and put this in place. Um, manage the transition. transition. Um, uh, we're in a period now that I like to call disruptive innovation. Uh, things are going to change. You're going to need to manage that tra transition. And you're going to need to measure the changes that are required for success. So all the pieces that we've been talking about in the tool, all the data elements that we've been and talking with you about you need to continue to collect those and, and, and understand at each step how you are moving towards your success. Modify your plan if success is not being achieved. This is a, this is a, a, a rapid change model. Um, you know, for some of us, we don't have a lot of time to make the changes. In the past, maybe 12 months, 18 months was a good time frame for making some of these disruptive changes with our staff and with our clients in the organization. 18 months is a lifetime right now as it relates to the operational environment. So you need to have that data. You need to be looking at this on a weekly and a biweekly and a monthly basis. You need to say, okay, we thought we had this brilliant idea. This was the plan that we had in place. These are the changes we were going to make. Guess what? We're not all brilliant. We've, I've had to do this a number of times. Go back. Take a look at what we we're doing. Say, no, that's not quite what we thought it was going to be. Let's tweak the process. Uh, let's go back. This is a this is a rapid change within qu uh, continuous quality improvement. And then uh, develop a detailed annual operating plan, as I talked about before, for up for coming years. Make sure that you have your goals and objectives, uh, and the ex and the anticipate the success you're going to to make in your plan and then, and then have that uh, worked out for the next couple of years. Um, monitor and evaluate. Evaluate the plan regularly as part of the continuous quality improvement process. The one thing I do know is, is that the conversations that we're having today are not the conversations we're most likely are going to be having 18 and 24 months from now. Uh, the environment is going to change. It's going to be market driven. Uh, we're going to be focusing much more on clinical outcomes and clinical efficiencies. Uh, so you, the, the continuous quality improvement process that you're putting in place today for your clinics and the strategic planning that you're putting in place today for your clinics is a, is a momentum and a process that needs to be maintained going forward. Because your environment's going to change. There's going to be new opportunities and new challenges attached with that. So one of the things that we hope through this, this, this webinar today is, is that you begin to understand strategic planning as a management process and as a way of moving your organizational organization forward in, in, a, in, in meeting the successes that you have. And so you should be building a structure. This is not what we're talking about here. This is not the end game. This is the start of a process. It's a start of a structure that you need to be building within your organization at the program level. Um, 
monitor your data continuously to maintain success and revise the plan as necessary to ensure continued success. So I think that really just to sort of um, summarize my portion of it is, is that this, the, this is an extremely important piece. It, it is a structure by which we need to be thinking about moving our clinics forward um, and how we use the tool and how we use the process. And if we put this kind of structure around, I think we're in much better ability uh, to be successful. Now, as we talked about before, since we're running out of time, there are a number of additional considerations um, here in the PowerPoint. So I would really suggest that you go out on the um, CTAC website when this is uh, posted and take a look and read those. And I'm going to pass this along to Andy, who is going to take us through the end of the uh, presentation. Great. Thanks so much, Dave, and, and, and Peter as well. Um, so we have a polling question real quick. I think we just uh, – we have two polling questions real quick. So if, uh, if uh, Ev, you can start those out. Um, the first polling question is, do you think your CIT has the tools it needs to begin thinking about the strategic planning question, yes or no, or not sure? Um, and the second polling question is, has your BEAM core implementation team been meeting on a regular basis to discuss uh, these trainings? So if you just answer those real quick. Um, and and uh, Ev, I would give it like 30 seconds and then close it down. Ev, if you want to shut it down and, and, and get the answers to those questions, that'd be great. All right, answers should be popping up in a minute. All right, so um, most people think that they do have the information they need. No one said no, so that's that's very good. Um, and then and then folks are in general meeting, you know, every every so often. Um, so just in terms of action steps for this, you know, it's not quite as clear as one of the other, you know, some of the other ones where it's been concretely like go back and do a, a specific thing. Um, but I think you know some of the action steps for this particular strategic planning webinar are really to start to sit down with, with your core implementation team and, and really figure out how you can use your financial model to do strategic planning. And I think it's one of two ways. I think if your organization isn't actively engaged in a strategic planning process right now, um, you know, what do you need to do as, as a core implementation team to begin to start that process, particularly around areas that have to do with the clinic? But if your organization is already engaged in a strategic planning process, and I know that many are um, totally independent of this or just because of the, you know, the numerous changes that are going on in healthcare right now, um, you may want to figure out how, if it's not done already, you know, the conversation with your implementation team is how do we integrate what we're trying to do in our clinic into that strategic planning process? And, and what kinds of things can we do to really make sure that we're a vital part of that process? And I think you know, some of the things that, that Peter talked about, about making sure that you have, you know, board buy-in, making sure that you have executive leadership buy-in, that you have your CFO on board, um, and using some of those kind of more practical techniques about how to do that I think are really helpful in terms of some of the things you're going to want to think about um, as you go forward and try to, you know, try to, to build this into your, your process internally. You know, and the other piece is really how do you use the data that you're developing from BEAM and other measures um, to really inform that process so that that process is based on data and not just based on instinct or, or, or kind of, um, you know, kind of what you, you assume is going to happen. The other thing that's come up in some of our recent conversations with agencies is this whole issue of the agency, and, and Dave alluded to this, the agency missing, uh, mission changing. And that where, you know, under a COP system, you might have been able to offer services to anybody who walked in the, the door. And then under this new system, depending on, you know, certain payment mechanisms and those kinds of things, you may have to make decisions about who you're able to offer services to and when and, and, and how much of those services are able to be offered. And so how do you kind of either um, deal with that with, in regards to your current core mission as an agency or how do you deal with that and maybe, you know, alter your core mission as, a, mission as an agency? And so just to start to think of some of those issues as we go forward, I think is really impor important. 
Um, so just in wrapping up, uh, part two of this, uh, you know, next week, obviously, uh, we have our office hours. So as you, you know, let Justine uh, know questions, either through the link here or by email, et cetera, we'll have our office hours next week for people who have questions. Um, and then this is a two-part module. So Chris Copeland is going to be presenting on the 24th. Uh, really talking about how to develop the strategic plan and, and how do you implement that in your agency and what does that process look like when it's on the ground. Um, and then we'll have office hours after that. Um, so again, we extended the data submission to the 15th. Uh, so please, if you haven't sent it in already, uh, please do that now or very, very shortly. We really want to get as much of that data as possible. And once we have that data and have analyzed it, for those who've submitted their data, um, we'll be inviting them to participate in a, a, a process where, by which we allow, you know, we, sh we report the data back to everybody. Um, and while we'll keep everybody's individual data confidential, we'll be able to report back and kind of see how you benchmark against other similar type organizations and that kind of stuff. So we really think that that'll be a useful process for you as an agency as you, um, 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 as you go forward. So again, contact us with questions, et cetera, and uh, we will go forward from there. So I hope all are well, and um, we look forward to, uh, to talking to you guys next week on the office hours and seeing you again in the new thing. And, and again, another reminder, if you haven't sent in your benchmarking tool, please do that. Um, and I hope everybody enjoys what at least right now outside is a, is a really nice day. So take care, everybody, and we look forward to uh, speaking with all of you soon and, and, and having a wonderful weekend. Take care. Bye-bye.